Are we live? Live stream. We are good. We're live stream. Good morning, Kingsway family. Good morning. Yeah, I was standing back there talking, and I'm like, man, I wonder when we're going to get started. And then, uh, yeah, that's on me. So here I am, and here you are. Welcome. Uh, happy Easter week. Uh, this, this whole week has been Easter week, and so uh, welcome back. And... Uh, uh, before we get started here, I want to um, I want to acknowledge. I don't I don't see him here, but um, Jenny's here. Jenny's here. Uh, so will you stand in proxy, Jenny? Uh, Brian Postinger uh, uh, and the kitchen crew, the staff, all last week, uh, you know, all all last Sunday rather, um, at Easter Fest. Can we just give them a hand? And and Jenny was a big part of that. We're just so thankful. Thank you. You made Easter Fest a big hit. Um, we couldn't have done it without that. It wouldn't have been the same. Um, and of course, we kept Jesus in the center. We made him. I mean, we made a big deal about him. And uh, we want to keep continuing that this morning, making a big deal about Jesus. So if you'll stand with me, I'm going to pray as we get started. And Lonnie and the team uh, will we'll be off to the races. <laughs> Oh, our Abba, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come together and celebrate uh, without, without fear of violence, without fear of being threatened upon, Lord. We can come and we can be in a, a, a good place, a safe place, and we can trust in, in, in your goodness and enjoy your presence. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you to be in this place. Um, and. We, we surrender to what you want to do this morning. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing with us.
Ooh, I got out of breath with that one. Anyone else? That's good. Oh. Anyone else so grateful for what you've been saved from? Holy moly. I am so grateful for what the Lord brought me out of. And I know we all have stories like that. Praise Jesus. We have a God who wants to save us, who saved us in the way that he did, and he's alive. Amen. Yeah. 
Isn't it good? Isn't it good to be in God's house and worshiping Him and realizing the amazing grace that He has cast on us today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's good news, church. Good news. Hallelujah. We thank Him today for that amazing grace. We didn't earn it, church. He did it because He loved us. Receive that love today in Jesus' name. Be covered by His grace and His mercy today. Hallelujah. This morning, we're coming to the Lord's table and the communion. And I want you to know this morning that if you know Jesus, if you know the Lord, and you have received him as your Lord, then you're welcome for, to take of the communion this morning. We, we acknowledge an open communion at Kingsway. And so you're welcome to join in as we have a time to observe the Lord's communion. And this morning, if you haven't, uh, if you want to observe communion, but you didn't get one of the little packets, would you raise your hand and our ushers will come and, and give you one. There's a couple here and anyone else that wants to celebrate communion this, this morning. You know, as we observe the communion today, I want those of you that are online to also observe it. We give you opportunity to do that. You can go and grab a cup of water and a cracker and, and observe the communion with us today. But I want you to know that there are aspects of the communion, the, the, the past, the present, and the future that we're going to acknowledge today. We're acknowledging that you know, the, the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That he, he was... He was literally broken and torn for our wholeness. And He shed our, His blood on that cross for our sins. And we're called to remember that in the communion. Each and every communion. You know, Paul wrote that in the scripture. This do in remembrance of me. And so every communion, we remember what Jesus did. And even more. And even more. And then today, we have the honor and the ability to fellowship with our God, the risen Lord, the risen Savior. We can observe fellowship with Him today, right now, and with one another for the finished work on the cross. Oh, what a God. Oh, what a God. To be in fellowship with Him and to know Him personally as your Lord. And then we look forward in the future to our hope in the resurrection. You see, Jesus didn't just stay in a grave. He arose. We celebrated that last week, remember? Jesus arose. And so we have hope. We have hope. That one day the promise will be secured that Jesus made 
that our sins are forgiven, that the devil is defeated and we have victory in Jesus. And one day, one day, we will be with him in heaven forever and ever and ever. Isn't that good news? That's good news, church. And so with that, I want to just read the scripture that Paul wrote in Corinthians. Let me get that on. Hopefully we don't get an alarm here. I got to get my old man glasses on. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and you find it in verse 23 to 26, okay? And it says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, take, eat, <laughs> take, eat. And then the scripture goes on and says, And in the same manner he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So with that, let's take the cup. Father, we thank you this morning for your grace and your mercy. And we give you praise for this time of fellowship at the communion table. Thank you that we can carry in our hearts the riches of your goodness. May we pour this out wherever we go, lighting up darkness with truth, speaking out hope where there is despair, and spreading your unconditional love to all those around us. May we go in the power and the strength of your Holy Spirit. Let our lives be all that you designed them and destined them to be to your glory. And we ask these things through the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well... I've seen a number of requests come in this morning. <laughs> and I know that there are a few in here that are giving thanks and praise to what God has done. But will you extend your hand and let's pray over these requests that God will act in his mercy and his grace. Father, we thank you today again that we can be with you in fellowship Father, we just ask this morning, there are many requests here that, that are of those in need and asking of you. And Lord, where there are those that, that need a touch of healing, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus, they be healed. And we recognize that in the, in the observance of your communion this morning. And Lord, for those that, that have other needs, material needs 
emotional needs and other needs, Lord, that, that we don't even know about, but you know all about. Father, we lift them to you this morning. And we ask that your will and your purpose be done, that you would be glorified in it and be recognized and that you would draw many to you because of the answer that you give. And Father, we pray together as one body, one church, in fellowship with you, that your will be done. And we pray it in your Son's name. Amen. And, you know, not too long ago, we were actually talking about tithes and offerings. And we we're kind of like reminiscing the day when you, you know, you pack, you pass the, the offering baskets. And uh, then this thing came along called COVID. And it kind of changed things a little bit, didn't it? And uh, so we started doing, promoting a little bit more of online giving, but there are those that still give. And so you can give this morning. I want you to give out of a, a joyous heart because you want to. You observe it as a thing of worship because it is. And just enjoy giving back to Jesus what he's put into your life. Amen? Amen. So you'll we'll see these little dispensers around, and there's one back there, a big basket. You can put your offering in it today. But let's pray over the offering that God will use it for his purpose and his glory. Amen? Father, we thank you that we have opportunity to give to your church, to give to the work that you have for King's Way. And Father, we pray that you will bless it, that you will guide us, you will direct us, and that we will use it in a stewardly way, Lord, to your glory and for your purpose. Father, we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And so, I think we have some young ones here this morning, the children of the church. You want us all stand, and we're going to pray over you, and then we're going to dismiss you. And my neighbor, I think it's Jeremy, he's back there. Is that you, Jeremy? Yeah, okay. Here we go. Father, we thank you for our young ones, for the children of the church, your future church, Lord. We pray, pray your blessing over them. Lord, we pray your blessing over our teachers that they will bring forth your word, the truth of your word, and that our young ones will take it into their heart and be encouraged by it and learn by it and become the person that you purpose for them to be. We ask it now in your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Well, church, you noticed this morning that... Uh, there's no Pastor Mike up here. But we have a pinch hitter for him this morning. And for those of you that don't play baseball, a pinch hitter is the guy that steps in for the guy that's supposed to be batting. Okay? <laughs> so, Eric, will you come? <laughs> amen. Um, amen. So before we start this video, um, we all... I think most of us got an amber alert, so we're just going to pray for that real quick. Um, Lord, uh, for that situation, uh, we pray for uh, your safety to invade, your justice, Lord, um, that authorities would find that vehicle um, and uh, resolve that situation um, uh, in your goodness, God, um, with no loss of life, no harm to, uh, to anyone involved, Lord, but that, that your justice would prevail. In that situation, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and play that video.
I go to prepare a place for you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And know that I will be with you always. So what now? <laughs> the disciples might have been thinking that. What now? Uh, especially, at least from that scene. Um, anyone ever been to Bible camp or church camp, something like that? Have you ever had post-camp blues? Where you're like, oh, well, that was nice. Back to real life or something like that. So you have this amazing experience. And uh, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you went to camp or maybe you had um, some pivotal moment happen in your life. Maybe you had, came back from a great vacation. And sometimes it's like I need a vacation from that great vacation that I had because um, I was just so busy. Um, but whatever, whatever it is, you have this lull. You have this. And, and maybe there's a mix of excitement, but a, a mix of, uh, well, what's, what's next? Well, here's what's next. And so we're going to turn to, um, to the, the scripture that that scene was based upon uh, in large part. And so if you'll turn or scroll or click over to Acts chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I'm going to pray. Abba, Father, bless your word. Let it go forth. Grant to me that I would speak boldly as I ought to. And I say in Jesus' name, those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the church. Amen. So Acts is written by Luke. And so here, here's what you need to know about Luke. Luke is a physician and a, an ancient historian. So he's an ancient physician, first century, and a first century historian. Um, and like his contemporaries, like Suetonius, Tacitus, Josephus, a lot of us's, <laughs> he, uh, he, likes his, he likes his sources. He likes to compile sources, he, especially eyewitnesses. If he can get an eyewitness, man, that's, that's what he's all about. And so he mentions that he wrote a previous volume. Um, and so I'm going to read along here. And, uh, and if you'll follow along, we'll have the words on the screen, but I, I want you to, if you have a, if you have a, a hard copy or a, a, a digital Bible in front of you, I want you to see the words in the Bible that's in your lap as well. Um, oh, and the other thing 
that's good to know about Luke is, is he is a first rate. We don't know what kind of physician he was. He was probably pretty decent, but he's a first rate ancient historian. He knows dates. He knows places. He knows names that are all appropriate, that are all, uh, that all fit within that context so that uh, we, can, we can be confident. So there's, he makes some claims that, we're, that we haven't yet been able to verify, that scholars haven't yet been able to verify, but claims that he has made have been verified and so that gives us confidence that the, the ones we're not sure about, he's probably, he's probably right about that too. So Luke is a great ancient historian. He knows geographically, especially the Aegean Sea region. Um, if, if you're familiar with um, Dr. Craig Keener's work, he does a lot of work in Luke Acts, that whole, that whole genre, um, which, is, which is historical. It, it's historical writing. It's ancient historiography. And so, like I said, Acts is written by Luke. And you'll see there in, in the first verse, it says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen. So Luke is saying, that he has a previous volume. That would be Luke's gospel. So Acts is really the sequel. And what he wrote in the prequel is that I, I did my best. He, he says this, since many have undertaken, this is Luke 1, verse 1, since many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting to me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in an orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So this is really important to him that he, he gets details correct for this, for this man, this guy Theophilus, that he's writing to, but also... Um, in view of anyone else who might read this letter, or not this letter, it's not a letter, but who might read this book, who might read this, this historical writing. Continuing in verse 3, it says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. The, the New Living Translation renders that uh, he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. Like he, he, was, he, he showed them in so many ways that he, he had been dead, but now he's physically, bodily raised. And he's there talking with them. And it says in verse 5, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. So that's not a short time. That's, that's over a month. And spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, he was, uh, while he was eating, scooch over here, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates which the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking up intently. Uh, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus has, who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. That's the word of the Lord. 
And so these angels show up here, and you probably noticed in the text, he says, this same, they say, this same Jesus who went is coming back in the same way he came. That, that crushes any pretend messiahs, anyone who would come and say, I'm the guy. Nope. Luke says you're wrong. In fact, the Holy Spirit through Luke says you're wrong. You're not the guy because you didn't come back on the clouds. You didn't come. You don't have the wounds. You don't have the proof. You're not him. This same Jesus. So that, that just gives us cult insurance. You know, no one's going to start a cult if we keep to the plain meaning of Scripture and we understand this same Jesus means this same Jesus. I, it, it can't get any more plain than that. So in biblical literature, there, you see various patterns, and I want to introduce you to a pattern in biblical literature. This, this is just something that happens in the lives of his disciples. Maybe we can relate to some of this. So let's throw up that first biblical pattern. So there's orientation, then a moment of disorientation, and then a moment of reorientation. So the moment of orientation is in verse 6. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they're still in a nationalistic mode. They're still in this mode of Jesus has come (laughs) to destroy Rome. And it seems like that they're still stuck in that mode of like, okay, he's come to restore the kingdom to Israel. That's their orientation. Here's the moment of disorientation. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. So he's not saying yes. He's not saying no. He's just saying it's not for you to know. Oh, kind of a bummer. I was hoping for like a yes, hoping against the no, but hoping, you know, but it's not for me to know. And what I want us to gather from that is it's not for you to know means it's not for you to know. You know, I I checked two other translations. One of the things they had in common with this verse, they all rendered it not for you to know. (laughs) Not for you to know. So if somebody says, I know when Jesus is coming back. Not for you to know. I have a book. Not for you to know. I have a chart. Not for you to know. I have it all worked out. I got my, my eschatology, my end times theology. It's all, it's all, it all works out. Not for you to know. This is not for you to know. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is it can become a distraction from what God has. So now that we know what's not for us to know, what is for us to know? This is our reorientation moment. Let's join the disciples in being reoriented to the mission that God has for us. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We have, to, we have to come back to that. And we have to come back to, so we have to focus. That's number one. To, to fulfill the mission that God has for you, you need to focus. For me to fulfill the mission that God has for me, I need to focus or I need to refocus. If something has taken my eye off the ball, which is to be a witness for Jesus, I have to refocus. And we, the second thing we need to do is we need to follow. So if we can go to the big ideas here, you need to focus. We need to follow and we need to fill up. So we talked about focus. Time to reorient. Get our, get our minds, get our eyes off of things that are not for us to know. The Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord, but the revealed things belong to us and to our children forever. So 
by God's grace, I'm going to share with you a revealed thing. We need to follow. And in order to follow, we need to look at what, what's the last directive that Jesus gave his disciples. So, click over to, to, uh, to follow. So, in Matthew's gospel, he says, go. In Luke's gospel, he says, stay. In John's gospel, he says, receive. And in Acts, we just saw, he says, wait. So what do we do? Do we go? Do we stay? Do we receive? Do we wait? Yes. Yes. So the idea is wait on the Lord and, and stay, stay in his presence. Receive. In John, in John chapter 20, verse 22, it says that Jesus breathes on his disciples and says to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And it's actually, in, in the grammar, it's in, in, in the imperative. So it's actually a command. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. And so, let me ask you. If Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, do you think they did? Yeah, they received the Holy Spirit. So there's this other moment coming that they haven't gotten to yet. See, in, in John 20, they're still in the upper room with Jesus. This, they, they haven't. Jesus hasn't ascended yet. And so he says, wait in Jerusalem, in Acts and, and in Luke. He says, stay or wait in Jerusalem until you receive power. So wait on the Lord till you receive power. And then the idea is go, then go. So there's this moment that's coming in the disciples' life. And so... We are called, uh, Derek Prince uh, talked a lot about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he, he called this um, uh, drinking in the Spirit. So just like you would, just, just like you would drink from a cup, you, 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 you drink in the Holy Spirit. You, you invite him to come into your life, and, and, and he, he, comes, he actually comes upon you. So this is that moment that's coming. So in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes. Who's familiar with that story, with that, with that account? The Holy Spirit comes, and it, there's a sound of a rushing wind, and it says that tongues of fire distribute on each person's head, and it says that they, they are immersed in the Holy Spirit. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak with other tongues. What's happening there? The Spirit in them is now overflowing out of them, and now it's giving them utterance to speak in languages they haven't learned. That's what's happening in that passage. And so, for us, we need to fill up. We need to fill up on what God has for us. If, if it was important for the early church, it's important for us too. And in order to fill up, we'll click over to that real quick. To fill up, we need to open our hearts to what the Lord has for us. We need to ask for more. Jesus said, with reference to the Holy Spirit, he said, ask, seek, knock. For the one who asks, it will be answered. The one who seeks, they will find. The one who knocks, the door will be opened. And then he says this. He says, what father among you, if his son asked for a fish, would give him a snake or a scorpion? He says, if you being evil or you being fallen, is another way to think of it. You know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more does your father, your heavenly father, give the Holy Spirit to you when you ask him? So there's this idea that we need to ask for more. And there's this idea that there is more. There's more to be had. And then be immersed to overflow, just like the early church was. There's another account in Acts. <clears throat> it's in chapter 8. I'll just read it for you. 8 and verse 14 says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So we, we also know from Scripture that anyone who believes, if you took communion this morning and you did it in faith, you're a believer. That means that the Holy Spirit is in you. Because the Bible says that he's, he's in us, he actually seals us for the day of redemption. So every believer has the Holy Spirit. But not every believer has experienced this moment where the Holy Spirit has come upon you and has filled you to overflowing. And so this is the encouragement, is to come and, and say, Lord, whatever you have for me, what more you have for me, I receive it. I want that in my life. And so, I grabbed a couple of Derek Prince proclamations because we haven't done these in a, in a little while and I like to do them. And I've got two for us today. And so we're going to start with this first one. So if we'll throw that up there. If you'll stand and if, if you will uh, declare this in faith, this is all based on scripture, we'll say these words all together. Ready? When I first came to believe in Christ, I was marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in me and will be with me forever. He is a deposit guaranteeing my inheritance with God. The Holy Spirit gives me power to witness. Through him, I speak the word of God boldly. Next slide. The Holy Spirit guides me into all truth. The Holy Spirit helps me in my weakness and helps me to pray in accordance with God's will. Through him, I pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. The Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus in me and through him, the love of God is poured out in my heart. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Those always get me pumped. <laughs> those always get me so excited. So, so the, those build my faith. When I declare the word and when I hear it, I hear it out of my own mouth, it builds my faith. I hope it did that for you too. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. But not every believer has yet experienced that upon moment where it overflowed, and now you're functioning in what, what are known as the gifts of the Spirit, which are, which are listed off in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's, it's a list of common expressions of the Holy Spirit. And so, why am I hammering on this? Well, first of all, I'm unashamedly Pentecostal. <laughs> I, believe in, I believe in the gifts. They're for today. And I believe in, in spirit fullness and spirit empowerment. And I believe that there are, are two kinds of immersion. I believe in immersion in water, which is what we do up here, believer's baptism. And then there's another kind of immersion, which is like standing under a waterfall. And that's kind of what like the spirit empowerment is like. And uh, again, Derek Prince, he said, he was looking at Niagara Falls and he said, you couldn't be under that for one minute without being totally soaked. So you, asking for spirit empowerment is like standing under Niagara and saying, let me have it. <laughs> you won't be there for one minute without being soaked. For missional empowerment, there are things that God has for you to do as a believer that you cannot do apart from Holy Spirit empowerment. Because he gives us boldness to witness. And through him, the love of God is poured out in our hearts. And so why wouldn't we want to receive more and more and more? You know, Paul, writing in his, his letter to the church in Ephesus, he says, and you could, some scholars say that you could over-translate what he says here. Instead of being drunk with wine, which is dissipation, which ruins your life, he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's this ongoing thing. Ongoing where you're receiving from the Holy Spirit. 
He says, that's the good alternative. That's the alternative to, to uh, wor worldly indulgence and intoxication is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. By the way, that would present a dichotomy that if you're engaged in worldly intoxication, you're not being filled with the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean you're not saved. That doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It just means you're compromised and you're not continually being filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. That's what that means. And because I want you to do, to be able to do what God has called you to do, I want to invite you to, first of all, acknowledge your need. First, for salvation. If you need salvation, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to give opportunity for that this morning. We, we sang about it. We talked about it. We're talking about it now. Paul outlines the case for the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says that Christ died for our sins, our wrongs against God according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. He appeared to his disciples and to their associates. Paul says he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, and he says that most of whom have fallen asleep, but some are still with us. And so as I've heard some commentators say, that means you can go check them out. Paul's telling the Corinthians, you can go ask around. You can check him out. You can ask him, did you see Jesus? Oh, yeah, I totally saw him. I put my hands in his wounds or, you know, in, in his scars, and uh, I saw him, just like Thomas did. And so he was seen alive. And the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. So I want to invite you to consider that this morning. Also acknowledge your need for power, for empowerment. If you want more of the Holy Spirit, you, have, you need to acknowledge your need for more and, and to say and, and, and to request more. It, maybe you need healing this morning, physical, emotional. That's available too. That's paid for too. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's the healer. And he, 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 is, he is ready to hear your prayer. And you can come and pray, and we will believe. We'll, we'll, we'll lean in, and we'll believe for healing. Because we believe that that's an expectation, that we should, ex that we should anticipate that. And that we should lean in for it and believe that God wants to do that. And, and let God do what he wants to do. And then if, if, we don't, if we don't see immediate results, we keep praying. We keep leaning in. We keep interceding. We keep trusting. Maybe you need hope this morning. Jesus is our soon coming king. Yes, not for us to know when, but he is coming. He's going to return. And maybe you need that hope this morning that he is coming back. And he's coming back for you and me. He's coming back for all of us. The other thing, after acknowledging your need, you need to be immersed in the spirit. Like I said, ask, seek, knock. That's what Jesus said to do. And so... What I want to do really quick, though, is talk about some common possible questions that people might have. So click over to possible questions. Question number one, will I get what I ask for? Uh, again, Derek Prince <laughs> said, if you ask for the right thing, you won't get the wrong thing. <laughs> you ask for the Holy Spirit. You ask the Father for the Holy Spirit according to what Jesus said to do in his name, you will receive the Holy Spirit. Another question that comes up, will I lose control? No. The Bible says that one of the things the Spirit produces in our lives is self-control. So if anything, you'll get more self-control. You'll become more aware of yourself. You'll actually receive discernment 
your discernment will grow over time. And you'll be able to judge spiritual experience by the word and by the inner witness of, your, of the Holy Spirit in your life. Yeah, another question, what will happen if I pray? Well, I believe that if you pray in faith, you will receive what you ask for. I believe it. Now, if nothing happens, nothing demonstrable happens, that doesn't mean you didn't receive it. I've, I've, I know of, of people who have prayed, and then a couple days later, uh, so a common experience is just like what happened in, in the book, second chapter of Acts, praying in a language you haven't learned by the, the power of the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit gives you the words. And, and uh, a lot of people do that. Some, some people don't. And if, if you don't do that, that doesn't mean you didn't receive it. But I'm, I'm just saying that that is probably the most common expression from Scripture and in my, in my own experience and what I've seen from other believers who, uh, who are within the Pentecostal charismatic tradition. A lot of them pray, in, as the Bible says, tongues, but pray in spiritual language. And so I've seen people receive it a couple days later, I've heard, I've heard of those, those stories. I got a buddy, his name is Dan. He pastors in Tacoma, Washington. And he received that gift without even receiving teaching on that gift. He was just driving along. He said, Lord, I just, I love you. I want more of you. And then he started to pray. S suddenly, it, like, were, other words were coming to his mouth. And so he decided to say those words, as I understand, as I remember the story. And, and he was so excited because he was so filled with joy and love. And, and, and he, he went and talked to somebody about it, and they told him what it was. <laughs> He's like, this thing happened to me. What is it? He's like, oh, it sounds like this. And yeah, that happens. But maybe the Lord will release a different gift in your life. And so I want us to go through another proclamation here. If you'll stand... We'll click over to the gifts of the Spirit. Here we go. Through the Holy Spirit, I have received power to be a witness for Jesus. The love of God is poured out into my heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to me. To me, the manifestation of the Spirit has been given for the good of all. I follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, the workings of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. I guard with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in me the good deposit that was entrusted to me. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So one thing about proclamation is it's also a, it, it's a way of praying. It's praying the scripture. So if you prayed that in faith, I believe that you're going to see some fruit from that. I believe that you're going to see results. I believe that you're, you may function in a word of wisdom. What is that? Well, the word of wisdom is a, a word that brings a, a insight or clarity to a situation that didn't come from human processing, human reasoning. It's smarter than we are, in a sense. A word of knowledge is, is, a, is a word that somebody gets about someone's specific situation that they couldn't have known otherwise, except that the Lord reveals that. That does happen. Uh, faith, gifts of faith. You know, Jesus said that uh, a, uh, just the mustard seed size of faith can demo an entire mountain. <laughs> and so I wonder what the gift of faith can do. If just a little bit of faith can remove a mountain, I wonder what the gift of faith can do. 
you're going to move mountains with the gift of faith. And healing, uh, the gifts of healing, we, uh, like I talked about, Jesus is the healer. And some people just, that the Holy Spirit gives them that gift, they operate in it regularly. And they pray for people and they recover. That's a gift from the Holy Spirit. The workings of miracles, that's kind of similar. But the other miracles, other things, um, uh, I've been in, in camp situations where the camp cook says, I don't think I have enough food. And guess what the Holy Spirit does? He multiplies the food. There's enough food. Uh, I heard of one pastor, he was talking about, he was, uh, I think he was ministering in Mexico. And he had a bag of Skittles. And he's like, I don't think I have enough Skittles. Well, the Lord multiplied the Skittles. He had, he had enough Skittles for all the kids and left over, if I remember right. So, and we see that in Jesus' ministry. He feeds 5,000 men, not including women and children. And, and it says they have 12 baskets left over, a basket per disciple. And, and they're full. So miracles happen today. Prophecy. Prophecy is, 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 is declaring God's word with power that's foretelling uh, or forthtelling, and then some, some aspects of prophecy, like there's a guy in Acts, his name is Agabus, and the Lord reveals to him that there's going to be a famine. So Agabus comes and says, hey guys, there's going to be a famine. The Lord says there's going to be a famine. We should probably prepare for that. And so they do. Famine comes, and the church doesn't suffer during the famine. So that happens. Discerning of spirits. Hey, who's, you know, so let's say somebody is... is um, you know, comes in comes into this gathering or something like that, and they start saying um, saying things that sound spiritual, but but are off. Well, someone with discerning of spirits and, and someone with doctrinal knowledge might be able to pick up on that, but maybe it's not it's not as detectable. And but there's just something off. Maybe there's maybe they they brought a spirit in with them or something like that. Well, the Lord can can do that in someone's life where they discern, they, they can tell spirits apart. Uh, good spirits and bad spirits. Holy spirits, uh, spirits from God, and spirits that aren't from God. And, uh, and then different kinds of tongues, different kinds of languages. Um, uh, often, sometimes, uh, we've had that actually happen here, where um, one of our members will stand up and, and give, give a word in a language that uh, no one here knows. Or, or ostensibly no one here knows. Sometimes that does happen where somebody gives a word in a language and somebody does know, and that's a, that's a pretty cool thing when that happens. But um, sometimes someone will give a, a language, uh, speak a language out loud, and then somebody else in the congregation will have the interpretation of that. What is the Lord saying through that? What, what's the rendering? How, how can we understand that? And, and then the, the church can be built up by that. Um, and then uh, Paul gives us instruction. He says that if there isn't someone to interpret, that that person should pray to, to themselves and to God. Because that still build, builds up the person when they pray in a language that they haven't learned, but they're praying according to the Holy Spirit. That still builds them up. That still, they speak mysteries in, in the Spirit between them and God. But it doesn't do anything to edify other people around them because they don't know what's being said. Does that make sense? So we want words to be clear in church. That's the idea. We don't want there to be confusion. We want to be able to explain everything according to Scripture. And so um, that is going to happen in your life. And I want to encourage you in that. And then the other thing we want to do to, to, to receive missional empowerment and to, to know what to do, what now we need to call for regular refills. I already referenced Ephesians, where Paul says, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's ongoing, that's continual. And so if we'll go to that last, the last slide here. And then do the stuff. John Wimber. <laughs> John Wimber was a vineyard pastor, and he, he, he would say, I want to be able to do the stuff. And because he was reading the book of Acts, and he says, well, before I got saved, the devil let me do his stuff. And, and why, why can't I do the stuff that God's kids do? 
And he's like, I want to do this stuff. So he just read the Bible, believed it, and he leaned in for it, and he started doing the stuff. You can do that too. So let's pray together. If this morning, uh, to that first call, if you want to receive salvation, if you want to step into that relationship with Jesus, uh, where you say, I want you, Jesus, to be the leader of my life, to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be very bold and raise your hand in this moment. faith. So for each one of these areas, for salvation, we're all going to say, Lord, save me on three. One, two, three. Lord, save me. For empowerment, we're all going to say, Lord, empower me on three. One, two, three. Lord, empower further prayer uh, if some of our prayer partners can can hang hang back uh, we want to be available for you uh, they and I will be available for you um, uh, and pastors any pastors who are here um, we want to be available for you to pray further and to hear your testimony that you said Lord save me today or to pray for you that you you would <clears throat> uh, receive more of the Holy Spirit and and operate in gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, and but or also to hear that uh, you prayed, Lord, heal me, and we can pray even more into that and look for God to do something amazing, and and then uh, also, Lord, Lord, give me hope. If you want prayer, we're here for that. But may the the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you be blessed on this sunny Sunday. Amen. 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 Dismissed.